Good morning and happy Mother's Day to all the moms. My name is Sean Valenzuela and this is my amazing wife, Tegan. Yes, we lead the church here and we just want to bring everyone a great happy Mother's Day and want to thank you for joining in our service this morning. Yeah, please enjoy the rest of the service. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, singing, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When the shadows of this life have grown, I'll fly away, fly away, like a bird from prison bars has flown. I'll fly away, singing, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away, fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away, singing, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. Morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Heart fighting soldier on the battlefield, Lord, I'm a heart fighting soldier. Oh, yeah, Lord, I'm a heart fighting soldier on the battlefield. Keep on bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I yield. You gotta walk right and talk right and sing right and pray right on the battlefield. You gotta walk right and talk right and sing right and pray right. Oh, yeah, you gotta walk right and talk right and sing right and pray right on the battlefield. Keep on bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I you I got a helmet on my head and my hand and sword and shield I got a helmet on my head and my hand and sword and shield I got a helmet on my head and my hand and sword and shield keep on ringing so to Jesus by the service that I you oh when I die let me die in the service of the Lord oh when I die let me die in the service of my Lord oh when I die let me die in the service of my Lord Keep on ringing souls to Jesus by the service that I use. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier. Don't you know, Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier. Oh, yeah, Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. Keep on bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I use. Keep on bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I use. Keep on bringing souls to Jesus. By the service that I yield. Oh Lord God Almighty. Oh Lord God Almighty. I'm gonna sing, sing, sing for you. Yeah, sing, sing, sing for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh Lord God Almighty. I'm gonna sing, sing, sing for you. Yeah, sing, sing, sing for oh, you. Oh, gonna work and pray and sing every day for you. Gonna work. And pray and sing every day for you, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Gonna share my faith for you. Gonna share my faith for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Gonna share my faith for you. Gonna share my faith for you. Oh, gonna work and pray and share every day for you. Gonna work and pray. And share every day for you, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. I'm gonna preach the word for you. I'm gonna preach the word for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. I'm gonna preach the word for you. I'm gonna preach the word for you. Oh, we're gonna work and pray and preach every day for you. Gonna work and pray 
and preach every day for you, Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. 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 Hello everyone, my name is Timo Teo and can you all please turn your Bible to Acts chapter 15 verse 4 and I'll give you guys a little bit of time to turn there. Cool, and in Acts 15 verse 4 it says, When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. And this scripture takes place when Paul and Barnabas returned to Jerusalem after their journey through Antioch and the disciples greeted and welcomed them with open arms. And I love the scripture because it relates much about our church today. And when I went back to Samoa and also when I came back to New Zealand, and um, I know I, in a way I felt it was kind of weird in the first place. But at the same time, I felt really welcomed because my brothers, even though it was in the midnight, 2 o'clock, they still came to welcome me um, inside the church in the country as well. In the same way, this is what we do in every other church around the world is that if a brother or sister was to go to a different country, the, uh, they, will feel, uh, they will get welcomed by the church in the airport. In the same way, if they will come to New Zealand, we will go to the airport and welcome them as well. And we are a church that is all about welcoming everyone, just as the disciples welcomed Paul and Barnabas uh, in Jerusalem. And if you notice, we may have deep conversations, initiating hangout times, and are friendly to a point that it's scary. <laughs> and it's simply because we are always happy to welcome anyone into our family. And, you know, we hope to uplift your spirit through the songs and talks. And in today's service, we're going to have communion by our, our great sister Millie and our contribution by our brother in Australia, Jamie, and sermon by Sean. And, you know, we hope you all feel welcomed as part of the family, as friends, for we also want to be your friends. And for that, I just want to welcome you all to Auckland International Christian Church Sunday Service. <laughs> and let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father, I just want to thank you for this day, Dad, that we all come together and worship you, Dad, and give praise to you, Father. And uh, Dad, I just, I'm grateful, Father, for the brothers and sisters around the world, Father, and um, their generous heart, Father, and their welcome, uh, really warm heart, Father, to welcome each other, Father, inside the church, Dad, and showing love to each other, Dad. And that's how we're supposed to, to be, Father, to love each other, Father, is how you loved us. And Dad, in this time of uh, the COVID-19, Dad, I just want to pray for our families that are around the world, Father, that you just be with them, helping them stay safe, but also staying with the leaders and disciples in different churches around the world, Father, and helping them stay faith in this battle, Father. And Dad, I just want to pray in your son's Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Kia Welcome to the good news segment of the service. First of all, we have some homegrown good news. The Prime Minister just announced, as a country, we might be going into alert level two. What does that mean? That means us as a church, physically, we can start meeting together. So if you live in Auckland, we want to encourage you to please come on in, come to service, and join us in fellowship. If you live a little bit outside of Auckland, we are still going to live stream our services, and so please join us there. We are excited to see everyone. Now, there is so much good news coming from our churches around the world as restrictions are being lowered in many places. Our brothers and sisters in Samoa were very encouraged this last Sunday as they were able to meet together as a church again once the restrictions had been reduced. And this is the first time that they've been able to meet since the country was announced in a state of emergency. It is so amazing to see the strengths of this culture as this was one of the first things to have loosened restrictions on was their church events. We are confident that God will be glorified as people can once again see the disciples' love in person. 
And just kind of a, a bittersweet sweet news here, we understand that the spread of the virus worldwide has brought a lot of different ramifications. Mm -hmm. But we want to highlight some good news out there in Washington, D.C. They had a very hopeful and prayerful heart about the causes and the distress brought on many churches around the world. And so they brought together and got a benevolence offering gather some money, and sent it out some churches around the world. That being Malawi, Kenya, and Uganda. And it was just awesome. And they felt super overjoyed once received this money so that they can buy food and other provisions for their families. I want to bring you good news from the benevolent arm of our church, which is Mercy Worldwide. Mm -hmm. Now, Mercy is an organization that works hand-in-hand -hand with the church to help people who are in need. There are a range of initiatives that are happening right now with Mercy, but I really want to highlight the work that is being done in Cebu, Cebu in the Philippines. Hazel Joyce and her son Jimmy, they personally made 48 food baskets and handed them out to people on the street. As a developing country, there are many disciples in the Philippines who are also in need. And so Mercy Worldwide has provided them with food packs for families and disciples in need and also with many basic supplies. They are also doing great work to help um, a specific jail in the Philippines. It's the BJMP Cebu City Jail. It is meant to house up to 500 um, prisoners at once, but right now it is currently overcrowded with over 6,000 inmates and, and the virus has been detected in there and has taken some lives. Mercy Cebu has provided for their needs also with these food packs and really helping out the people in need here and also helping the prison guards with face shields and to help them protect in these trying times. Amen. I want to also bring you some good news from Miami, Florida. It was awesome that God this just past week blessed the church with two baptisms in their Latin ministry. Now of special note, um, Yannette's mom, Gloria, was baptized, and this was a 13-year project for Yannette. A few years ago, as the Dominican Republic was hit by a huge hurricane, Yannette actually lost a fam some family members, and even the country there, a lot of people lost everything that they had, and her mom was there. Soon enough, her mom, Gloria, moved to the United States, and once she saw the kingdom and all the disciples and their love, she decided to make Jesus the Lord of her life. That's awesome. Um, so that concludes our good news segment for this week. There is so much happening all around the world. So please like um, and subscribe to our good news email, which sends out monthly updates about all the good news happening in the churches. Thank you. Awesome. Have a great day. Hello. If you have your Bibles with you, can you please turn to Ephesians chapter 2? We'll read verse 8 and 9. This is the part of the service where we take up communion. Now, if you're just joining with us, communion is just a time where weekly we reflect on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and him going to the cross and what that means for us. We usually like to get somebody from the congregation to express what the cross means to them at this point in time in their lives. Today, we have the honor and privilege of hearing what Millie has to say about what the cross means to her. She has asked me to read for her Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It reads, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And with that, We'll transfer it over to Millie. Hello everyone, my name is Millie and I get the incredible privilege to share what the cross means to me at this point in my life. And at this time, it means freedom. Just by way of background, I'm 27 years old, currently living in Auckland, New Zealand, and after moving here, after moving here from Sydney, Australia, a place where I've called home for the past six years. While my parents are Nigerian, they, have moved, they did move to America as a young couple. This is where my siblings and I were born and raised. I grew up in a family of six and was baptized into a Christian just over three years ago. Before becoming a Christian, I was never the type of person who ever wanted to become a Christian. Having a relationship with God, 
reading my Bible, or even praying was the last thing on my mind. My mom tried raising my siblings and I to love God, and because of this, I chose to rebel from him in my heart. I would often make jokes during family prayers, intentionally sleep in to avoid coming to church with my mom, and when I would come to church, though I loved the singing and would sing with the choir, I would often make it my mission not to pay attention to the readings or the sermons, but would distract myself to focus on everything and anything but God and his word. When I attended the university, my distance for God grew even more. I no longer lived with my mom, so the accountability to go to church or to even join her in prayer was gone. Instead, I used my spare time outside of class to indulge in drinking, impure relationships, and drugs. I found that my purpose was to live for the weekend, and I put my value in the way that I looked and the status of, of friendships and popularity of camp on campus. I did what I could to climb the social ladder by being friends with people from different crowds, I threw house parties, and even competed inwardly against friends when it came to counting the number of men that I could be with throughout the year. Though this was the life I lived for three years, my heart was burdened by the very beginning of it. Looking back on my behaviors now, I realize just how selfish, insecure, vindictive, rash, envious, and conceited I have become, and how living this way left a large void in my heart and affected the way I valued myself and damaged my peace of mind. Fast forward to six years later, which is where I am now, I am a Christian and no longer indulge in the life that I lived at uni. I've often, however, I've often allowed my past to condemn me and to guilt me into believing that the sin I committed before my baptism will now dictate the outcomes of my future with God. Guilt is something that many women are prone to and it's truly haunting. I have often fallen into the belief that when God sees me, he sees the woman of my past and the lustful desires that ravaged any chance of having a relationship with him. This is especially true when I fall into temptation or rely on my own power to fight against it, which always proves to fail. However, I do believe that when Jesus said to the adulterous woman in the Bible that he did not condemn her for her sin, but told her to leave her life of sin, he was speaking to me. And the many women today who believe that their sin and that their past can hold power over their lives and that they can't change. But when Jesus says something, he means it. My ability to leave my life of sin is dependent on my reliance of Jesus and the power of the cross. I love the scripture in Romans 8 because it uniquely describes God's love for man and why Jesus' death on the cross is such a powerful reminder of his indispensable love that will never fade away. As a baptized Christian, I have died to my sin. I've also been cleansed of it. And though Jesus' death on the cross does not erase the past, it sets me free from it. Jesus' death was an offering to God that he used to show me the depth of his love and the freedom that comes from accepting and choosing to live in his love rather than being condemned by guilt. As the scripture reads, Jesus was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering so that I might live freely and righteously as God requires. For me, living freely, this means accepting and living in the love that God promises me. To be free or to be set free from, some, from something means to no longer be confined or imprisoned. The source of freedom, the true freedom is the cross that will remain so for eternity. It is what God provides me well before I was even able to live, before I was even born, to prove his loyalty and devotion to me, even when I believe I don't deserve it. God loved me so much that he used the extremities of death on the cross to prove to me and the world that there is no power greater than love and the eternal gift that comes with it when we choose to accept it. Thank you. Thank you, Millie, for sharing so vulnerably about what the cross means to you. Now, each of you in your home, as you take the bread, which represents Jesus' body, and the juice, which represents Jesus' blood, let's please go together in prayer. Bow your heads. 
Father God, thank you so much again that we have so many brothers and sisters that we can just get the understanding of what the cross means to them, God. I thank you so much for Millie and her just sharing vulnerably about Grace Father and her, her voyage on what that means to her, God. I really do pray, Father, as we take the bread, as we take the juice, Father, we can reflect on the cross and understand the gift that we have been given, and that is grace, Father. That we have all fallen short, that we have all sinned, that we have all missed your glory, Father. But it is simply because of grace that we get to even pray to you and have a relationship with you. Thank you again, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, how's it going guys? My name is Jamie, I'm from the Sydney International Christian Church and in this part of the service, we're gonna be doing the, the contribution. And so, if you've got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter six, verses 37. And when you're there, it reads, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I really love this scripture. So basically it's saying, the same way that you judge people, will be the same way that they judge you. 
The same way that, that you give to others will be the same way that they give to you. Now, if, if you don't believe this, I'd, I'd love you to give it a test. Like, I can, I can vouch that it has worked definitely in my life and the same measure that I use, it definitely gets measured back to me. So when I'm really generous, I get a generous response back. So when, when I was generous in giving to, to the Auckland International Church, um, then boom, we got more disciples. And then all of you guys have come out of it and uh, and now preaching to, to the rest of Auckland and, and it's just really great to see. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for, for your continual hearts to, to always be giving your whole hearts and generously sharing the, the word and just, just going out there with faith and, and conviction. It, it really helps my heart to, to know that we've now got a church in my home country, in my home city, at my home, and you guys are there leading it powerfully and effectively. I just want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart and encourage you to, to give generously as it will be given to you. Tell me whose side are you fighting on? I'm fighting on the Lord's side. Tell me whose side are you fighting on? I'm fighting on the Lord's side. I'll fight, I'll fight, I'll fight, I'll fight. Fighting on the Lord's side. I'll fight, I'll fight, I'll fight, I'll fight. Fighting on the Lord's side. Now tell me whose side are you sharing on? I'm sharing on the Lord's side. Now tell me whose side are you sharing on? I'm sharing on the Lord's side. I share, I share, I share, I share. Sharing on the Lord's side. I share, I share, I share, I share. Sharing on the Lord's side. Now tell me whose side are you preaching on? I'm preaching on the Lord's side. Now tell me whose side are you preaching on I'm preaching on the Lord's side I preach I preach I preach I preach preaching on the Lord's side I preach I preach I preach I preach preaching on the Lord's side now tell me whose side are you fighting on I'm fighting on the Lord's side now tell me whose side are you fighting on I'm fighting on the Lord's side I fight I fight I fight I fight Fighting on the Lord's side, I fight, I fight, I fight, I fight, fighting on the Lord's side. Good morning everyone, my name is Sean and the first thing I want to do is just give a happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the church that being Marco, and any other mothers that are listening on in as well. Happy Mother's Day to you, Sue. Uh, you guys are doing such an amazing job. You're not only mothers to your kids, but we really feel here in the church that you are such a great example of spiritual mothers to us as well. And we just want to say uh, we send our love to you as a church, and to me, uh, I just want to say individually as well, love you very much. If you guys have your Bibles with you, can you please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. You know, on Mother's Day, I guess it's just thinking about our moms, right? And we can think about, you know, there, there are many different ways that we have learned in our lives. But I believe that the greatest teacher is not experience or even our hopeful fathers, but it is the mothers that teach in our lives. So we have all learned something from our caring mothers. First, it would have came naturally as we're babies and going as toddlers. Then when it came a little bit reluctantly as we became teenagers. Then we were hopeful that we learned enough as we reach adulthood. And then there are many out there that are wishfully as their mothers are no longer with us. But because of this, that our moms have been such a great influence in teachers in our lives, that they hold a special place in our heart. And I believe even more so in the church. Funny enough, the very first celebration of Mother's Day took place in a church in America. That there's something about the faith that we recognize how much mothers love. I actually believe that a mother's love is the highest form of love we get to experience here on earth. 
You know, have you ever heard, hey, that person has a face only a mother can love? Right? That is not a compliment in any way, shape, or form, but it does compliment mother's love. That they love so much, it doesn't matter what anybody looks like. That a mother love so deep. But I do hear, though, that many mothers have said and it be told that motherhood is not always easy. So I am told. This is actually a story of this woman being in countdown with her little child. And the child is crying and just making this big fuss and doesn't want to be there. And the mom is just patiently saying, it's going to be okay, Sarah. Calm down, Sarah. Sarah, we're, we're almost going to go home, Sarah. It's going to be soon enough. And one of the employees went up to her and said, wow, you need to be commended for how patient you have been with little Sarah this whole time. The mom looked at the employee and said, I'm Sarah. <laughs> Motherhood is not always easy, but we do understand it is important. It is said that when God wants to do a good work, he grabs hold of a man. When he wants to do a great work, he grabs hold of a woman. And how true that is as we read the Bible. We look at all the miracles that God has planned throughout the scriptures and we understand it began with a mom. Exodus began with a woman having faith that little baby Moses would be protected as he let him go in the river. The line of David began with the woman Ruth. The preservation of Israel from Persia was founded on the bravery of Esther as she had a faith that put her life on the line before a king. Even the Gospels started with Mary, the mother of Jesus. As we read here in the Bible and start to realize the awesome story of Samuel, that it, yes, it is a story of three great men, Samuel, Saul, and David. It all began with a mother. My point, my uh, title for this morning is Mark's of a great mother. Point number one is great mothers have great problems. Again, if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. I believe it's good to state this right away that great mothers have great problems. It's important to understand that because I believe that we can start to have a view of motherhood with this view of perfection, that they have to be perfect. And even those that are entering into motherhood have this high expectation for themselves that they, if they mess up a little bit, their, their child is going to randomly grow some deformity or something. But we have to understand that even great moms have great problems. Sometimes we can view motherhood as we view the patriarchs of the Bible, that they're perfect, right? That they always have great insight. They're so humble. They glow in the dark. They can touch their toes. They can do all these great things that we cannot but as you read in the Bible, we start to see these great men and women of faith also had great problems. And that's the same thing with mothers as well. You know, they had great problems and mothers do too. To be honest, some of us are those great problems. <laughs> but it's really good that when we start to look here in the Bible, that moms have great problems, but they face them with great problems faith. As we're starting to look in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse 2. You can read verse 1 to yourselves and have fun with that. I don't feel like reading all those names right there. But mainly we have this man, Elkanah, who we're going to call Al because we're here in New Zealand. We like giving nicknames. And he had two wives. Let's read about these wives. 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 2. He, being Al, had two wives. One he called Hannah, and one he called Penina. Penina had children. Hannah had none. For Mother's Day, we're going to start talking about a woman who was finding it difficult in becoming a mother. We read here it says, Hannah had no child. There's actually a lot of emotion in this verse. That Hannah was lacking what made her feel fulfilled. See, back in those days, 
Being able to have children was vital to a woman's worth. That the more children that you had, the better. And it was actually seen as a blessing from God. As we read in verse, uh, excuse me, uh, Psalms 127, verse 3 through 4, it reads, Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. It talks about like, like a warrior with an arrow is a woman with a child. That if you have a warrior with a bow but no arrow, that's like Hannah with no child. Powerless, feeling useless, no value. Childlessness had such a stigma that it was seen as an infliction by God. See how here she saw her situation in verse 11. 1 Samuel 1 verse 11, it says, And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give to him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. You see here how she saw her situation? Even in prayer, she was talking to God and said, hey, this is the reason for my misery, that I have no child. This is the reason I am so missing. In other versions, it actually states here that this was her servant's or your servant's infliction. She saw this as an infliction from God. Even with Jacob and his wives. First, we have Leah when she was actually able to become pregnant. She says, God looked at my affliction. Rachel was actually noted praying, saying, God, give me children or I will die. That she wasn't just being dramatic. It was vital to her right here. In the past, with that culture, one rabbi has said that there are three people who are going to be excommunicated by God. Two of which, a Jew with no wife, and a Jew with a wife but no child. That in that culture at that time, if you didn't bear a child in 10 years, it was grounds for divorce. Or, the husband can actually marry another wife. And that's where Penina comes. And we're going to start nicknaming her Penny for our cause. See, her first problem was that she couldn't bear a child. Her second problem is that she had a rival. It wasn't just stated in these verses that she was childless. It was actually mentioned that Penny had children. Read verse 4. Whenever the day came for Al to sacrifice, he would give portions of his meat to his wife Penny and to all her sons and daughters. That it wasn't just her and a field, all her sons and daughters. That this was her rival, made, her, made Hannah feel useless. In this time where the festival and the feast should be a time of rejoicing, we can kind of put ourselves in, in Hannah's sandals. It was a time of sorrow, a reminder of her lacking. And it wasn't that just Penny had kids. We're going to see how she treated Hannah as well in verse 6 through 8. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Al would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? We read in this verse, Penny the Pest, right? Are you serious? Provoking Hannah to the point that she cries and would not eat. That her purpose for this wasn't just she was mad or anything. It was to irritate her. Right? Some moms actually think that that purpose or that job has been passed down to kids now, kind of poking and prodding them on. But no, but this was a real rival. Infertility is defined as not being able to bear or become pregnant or conceive after one year of trying. 
or the inability to carry pregnancy to a live birth. Actually, here in New Zealand, approximately one in six couples in New Zealand experience infertility. The cause is equal between men and women, and it causes huge hurts in relationships. But I, I want to say two things when it comes to this particular issue. One, I don't know why it's so connected, but childbearing in the sovereignty of God is one of God's sovereignties. It's one of those things that he overlooks. And it's something where God and your value to God is not based off if you can produce, that you are valuable no matter what. And the second thing is that you're not alone. Most women that experience childlessness are the patriarchs of faith when we get into the scriptures. We look at all the women that, that couldn't actually bear children. We're the women that we look up to in the Bible. It actually goes to show that it proves that you, when you're without child, you are not cursed, but you are kept. You are kept for a bigger purpose, or maybe just for a different timing. See, we see here that this would have been such a huge issue for them. And we can have issues in our lives as well, even if you're not a mom. And the thing here we read is that with these issues, Al couldn't fill Hannah. He couldn't make it all better. He couldn't just pat her on the back and say, everything's going to be okay. That in the story, we have two different types of people. We have one with the, someone with an empty heart, and we have someone trying to fill it. Al kept kind of going to her and saying, hey, look how much meat I am giving you. Look at all this steak. Look at all this spam. Look at all this pork and pig and everything. Look, I I'm giving you the best of the best. Why aren't you happy? And actually, in the Bible, when you want to honor somebody, you give them a double portion. We even kind of get reminded of Joseph and his brothers. When the brothers actually came to Egypt, he gave his youngest brother, um, Benjamin, five times more than he gave everyone else. It was actually a sign of honoring and love. And so Al, he was trying to show Hannah love right now, right there. And he loved her. He honored her. But he couldn't fix her problem. And this shocks most men. One, it's because food fixes our problems. <laughs> right? But two, is also food sometimes fixes women's problems. Have you ever had somebody get hangry and you just say, go and eat? It, but this problem wasn't going to be that simple. He says, I've given you all these things and everything. And Hannah's just like, hey, stop with the choice meats. I don't want any more steak. I don't want any more lamb. I don't want any more of this and that. Al, you need to stop. This is not your problem to fix. Have you ever tried to fix something and just make it worse? And then you're actually more frustrated with yourself or more embittered because of it? That you are now more hurt because you did your best and it wasn't enough. See, we have those that have great problems and those that are trying to fix those great problems, but doing it all the wrong way. I believe it's because with our hearts, it's not about what we put in, it's that it's broken. And it's not always within your qualifications to fix it. And that can be hard, especially for men who just want to be the fixers. I know for me, this is something that I had to learn through in my marriage. See, as we began, Tegan and myself, we have a happy and awesome marriage, and I love her to death. But when we began our marriage, there were some things that happened in her family that were extremely hurtful and damaging. And there would be times where she wasn't happy. She was sorrowful. She was hurt. It was still fresh in her heart. And I tried to do all the little things that maybe Al tried to do. And it was difficult to separate my wife's happiness from the quality of me being a husband. Because we can see that. Well, hey, my, my wife is crying. I must be doing something wrong. I should be able to fix this. And that was extremely hard. 
And I think what we do is we try and pour all these things into different people and realize, again, it has nothing to do with what we're pouring in. It has everything to do that it's, it's broken. Right? We find somebody who's, who's lacking, who doesn't have much going on in their heart. And we come on in and we say, hey, well, I'm going to give you my love. I'm going to give you all the love. I'm going to help you. I'm going to be patient with you. I'm going to be there. I kiss you. I hug you. I say, wife, you're so beautiful. I'm here for you and everything. And still by the end of the day, they're feeling empty. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, that's because you gave them the wrong thing. Right? No. They need to have more things. They need to have pleasure in their life. Give them money. I gave you a car. I give you nice clothes. This is awesome. I give you a good house. You got everything, baby. Why are you feeling down? This is all great. Right? And then still, we're like, okay, well, they're still feeling empty. And that's because, well, you're not giving them quality things. Here, I'm going to start reading them to the, the Bible. I'm going to give them, come to church more. Come love God more. Sing this song with me. Do this with me. Let's have fellowship. Let's go after it. And still, even when it came to spiritual things, they're still feeling empty. Why? Because we can try putting all these different things because it doesn't work. Even when you try to put God in their life, it doesn't work. Instead, we have to heal the cup. We have to heal the heart. There's no point in pouring more in when it is broken. Well, then you ask, well, how do you do that? How do you actually heal? Well, to be honest, I think our hearts are always going to be a little bit broken. Our hearts are always going to be a little bit messed up. Even those that come into a saved relationship with God, they still feel like, I can feel sometimes that I am still hurting. And guess what? I want to tell you that that's not um, rare. The only thing is you got to learn how to do is to fix it. The first thing is no one else can be your fixer. The thing that you have to do is stop messing up with things and trying to put things into your heart is that you give your heart to God and totally submerge yourself under God. See, when you get baptized, there is a meaning behind that. Fully submerging yourself. It says when you're baptized, you are fully clothed with Christ. That yes, you're always going to be kind of leaking and whatever, but if you just stay submerged, if you just stay in God, it doesn't matter. God is always going to continue to fill you because you are filled with God. You are surrounded by God. My first encouragement here to those in motherhood and those outside is that we all have problems in our lives. But stop trying to find things to fill your heart with. Realize that our hearts are broken and only God can fix it. And the only way we can stay in this filled relationship with God is if we submerge us with God. Meaning you just put your entire heart in your relationship with God. You start to dig deep in your prayers. You start to dig deep in your reading. And you just only have on your mind, I got to surround and fill myself with God. My first challenge is just to do that. Submerge yourself in God. Point number two, great mothers keep great priorities. Continue reading in verse 9 in 1 Samuel chapter 1. See, it says here, Once when they had finished eating and drinking in, in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the door uh, doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and made her vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you would only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give to him, to the Lord, all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, but her lips moved, but uh, lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, right, as any good priest would, and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. 
How encouraging, he replied, right? <laughs> Not so, my lord, she replies. Hannah replies, I am a woman who is, in deep, who is deeply troubled. And I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. We read here, the good priest Eli assumes that she's drunk at the temple. And he accuses her of such, being the good encourager. And how does she reply? She says, I'm not drunk, I am praying. Now hopefully, no one in the church will ever have to say these words. If you have to explain yourself like that to me, Something has gone wrong with our relationship, right? Hopefully you never say the words, I'm not drunk, I am praying. But we actually get to see a serious part of Hannah here. This that we see is a woman in prayer totally depending on her relationship with God. And we see here that she was weeping bitterly. See, when there are tears in the eyes, there is testing in the heart. And what we don't hear is her and her prayers, and even in her interactions with others around her, that she's complaining about her husband. Nor does she ask God to smite her, her rival there. She knew what her problem was, and it wasn't about them. It could not be solved by them. But she took it to God. In another version, it says that she says, not just Lord Almighty, but Lord of hosts. Meaning that, that that title to God meant the master and commander of the armies in heaven. That she was looking at God as the one who was totally in control. And we hear, we take notice that she continued to pray. That this wasn't simply a religious ritual or filling the air with words, but she fought in prayer. We continue to read here at the end in the, the, the collection of all this in verse 17 and 18. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant what you have asked him. She said, may your servant fill a fine favor in your eyes. And then she went away and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. That she was looking at God as the one who was totally in control. And we hear, we take notice that she continued to pray. That this wasn't simply a religious ritual or filling the air with words, but she fought in prayer. We continue to read here at the end in the, the, the collection of all this in verse 17 and 18. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant what you have asked him. She said, may your servant fill a fine favor in your eyes. And then she went away and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. So for men, we get to read here, yes, we're a little right. Food does help a little bit. <laughs> but we also take notice of what the great change was and the great catalyst. We notice that this woman, first she was in anguish, and now she is leaving affirmed. That she had peace that passes understanding. All that to say that here is a woman that had a real relationship with God. There was a depth and uh, a, an affection relationship here. And it was all because she took her problems to God. She knew what her priorities were. It was God first. She needed to sort out her relationship with God and everything would be taken care of. There is a saying that says, if you want to change the world, get a mother to pray. Abraham Lincoln actually said that no one is poor who has a godly mother. See, it is the prayers and the relationships that mothers have with God that have changed the world. Hannah had a great problem, but she also had a great prayer. It is not recorded of her going to her husband for comfort to fix her, or to blame him. But she went to God with her problem. Her priorities were right. She did still have a great relationship with her husband, right? She it wasn't just God. She did have a loving relationship with her husband. He honored her with food. He tried to do the best he could, but she understood it was God first. That she loved God, and then she loved her husband. She had a great relationship with her husband. She loved her husband. He loved her. 
And it is actually said that for those that are in parenthood, the best gift that you can give to your kids is to publicly in front of them, show your love for God and for each other's. That if you start to show love with God and with other people and and with each other, that they won't start going and looking for it in other places. So you don't want to be the family where they went to church to dedicate their child. They just got born, dedicating it to the, to, the, to, to the church and to the family. And driving home, there's little Timmy in the back seat, and he's crying and crying and making a fuss. And at last, the parents turn around and say, Tim, why are you crying so much? And he said, it's that pastor. He said that hopefully you guys are raised in a good Christian household. But I want to stay with you guys. See, we don't want to be that family, right? We've got to raise our kids right, showing the love of God. It is actually shown and proven that the most contributing factor to children having a difficult future and making bad decisions is if they lived with their parents in a, in a two-parent household or in a single-parent household, if their parents were together. The sad thing is, for even me and the reality of that, is growing up in L.A., I literally cannot think of one of my friends anywhere in high school growing up that both of their parents were still together. And it's quite shocking of how important that is to a child. See, Hannah knew her love for God. She had great love for her husband. She prioritized these relationships, but she also valued her family. Family. 1 Samuel 1, 19-23 says, Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and they went back to their home at Ramah. Al made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. When her husband Al went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Al said, uh, told her. That's a great response right there. Stay here to, until you have weaned him. Un- uh, only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. So you read here that she had such a great priority to her son. That during this time when the feast now could give some meaning and some celebration to her, she has a kid. She decided instead that she was going to pull back from those ceremonies and these festivities so she can wean her son. And what it meant, it meant to fully nourish and uh, and nurture her child. And this wasn't like how we do today. It was a few months or maybe even a year. It was several years. In this time in the culture, it can be up to seven years or more. And it wasn't just physical nourishment. It had the responsibility of maturing them spiritually as well. And we see that throughout the Bible. We even remember Paul when he wrote to Timothy that he talked about his spiritual learning from his his mom and his grandma. Right? Had nothing to do with his father. That they were the ones that took up the teaching spiritually. And I believe even for myself, this is personal because I know I learned my love for God from my mom. From both of them. My, my biological mom and my adoptive mom. I know I remember that the very first memory I have of prayer and what it meant to pray is when I learned from my biological mom as we are watching the movie Bruce Almighty. When Jim Carrey was first praying this weak prayer, kind of like he said for like a a beauty pageant, you know, I pray that people have good food. I pray for the safety of others. And, and, uh, you know, God in character said, okay, that's not a very good prayer. And then he prayed something different. He prayed something deep in his heart. And I remember my mom, when I was like five or six, said, hey, that's a real prayer. And I still remember it to this day. I remember from my adoptive mom, that she taught me that prayer sometimes is the only option. She is a selfless woman. 
who has bent over backwards for many people that she loved. And I would see her tirelessly going after to change people and help people. And I still remember many times, though, she was saying, I've done all I could. Sean, now we just need to pray. And I thank my moms for what they have taught me. There's a Jewish proverb that says, God couldn't be everywhere, so he created mothers. Now, theologically, I don't agree. <laughs> but I do believe it's a good thing to say on Mother's Day. That... God couldn't be anywhere, everywhere, so he created mothers in their love. I think the challenge we get here, or the learning that we get from Hannah, is to have great priorities. Guys, we need to have great priorities in our life that we are going to live and die by. That God must come first, period. Above our husband, above our wives, above our kids. Yes, we have to be good mothers, but the best way to be a mother is to put God first in your life. And if there are things, quote unquote, competing for it, sometimes we can say, yeah, God's number one, but there are things that compete for it. We don't really understand what it means to put God number one, right? In my marriage with Tegan, she's my one and only. I don't go to people and say, hey, I'm married with Tegan, but that sometimes there's other women that compete. No, that's not how it works. She is the only one in my mind. The only one I ever see is just gorgeous, beautiful, awesome, amazing. She's the only one in my eyes, only one in my heart. It's the same thing it should be with God. There should not be any competition. Point number three in coming to a conclusion is great mothers make great plans. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 24 to 28. After he was weaned, that being Samuel, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephraim of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live. I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. Oh, you're that drunk woman. No. <laughs> I prayed for this child, and the Lord, Lord had granted me what I had asked him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his life will, uh, for his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. It's good to know the understanding of the Bible historically. And just a little historical background with the Bible. See, the modern Bible that we have today puts the books in order of Judges, Ruth, then 1 Samuel. But actually, in the Hebrew Bible, the order goes straight from Judges to 1 Samuel. Why is that interesting to know? Is because by the end of Judges, it depicts the nation of Israel being without a king and acting independently as they all saw fit. It was seen as the lowest of lows that Israel had gotten. And there was an immense problem. And so in the Hebrew Bible, it starts off with this huge issue, ends off with an issue. And in 1 Samuel, it begins with the solution. That the solution was going to be a child. And that was going to be brought by the prayer of a weak woman. And see, it was awesome. That her plan wasn't just to be satisfied with a child. God, give me a child so I feel good. She had a dream for him and was selfish in her, and selfless in her dreaming. When she finally received from God this gift, she gave, she gave him back. See, Hannah realized that everything we have is not really ours at all anyways. That everything we have, we're going to pass on to somebody else. We're only the stewards. You're only touching it now. Whether that's something uh, physical or even mental or emotional, all these things that you have, you don't own your children. You're going to have to pass that on. Someone else is going to have to take care of them. They're going to leave your household. They're going to get married. We're only stewards of the things that we have. Hannah understood this and had great plans for the things in her life. She couldn't dream selfishly. See, what, what we learned from Hannah here is that she didn't just involve God in her planning. That her plan was God. That was it. The whole plan was to dedicate it to God. 
And that's what we have to do in our planet. Some people start to treat God as like he's a child that we're just getting involved. Right? Have you ever got a child just to help you in like a little task around the house where you get them to hold the cup while you pour things in? And it makes the child feel involved, but you didn't really need their help. Sometimes we do that with God. We've already decided what we want to do in our hearts. We already decided what our plan is. And we just pray to God so he can feel involved and we feel good about it. No, the plan has to totally be surrounded and be God. That is not about just, oh, I want to get good grades or I want to get my degree and God, hopefully you can help me with this. Is you should understand you're doing this because of blessing of God. You're doing this to show honor and give glory to God. That the plan doesn't just involve God, it is God. Do you have dreams that are solely based on God? Stop looking for others to push you to dream for God. Start to look at yourself. For those that are outside the church, come on into the church. Let us teach you what it means to have a dream for God. In conclusion, I want to end with these reminders that we learn from our mothers. One, that you are valuable regardless of your problems. We think that our problems or our pains make us less. But there's nothing to be ashamed about. You are loved by God. And guess what? We love you too. And hopefully you love me through all my problems and issues. When we have pain, excuse me, when we have pain, God has a plan. When we are at our worst, God is at his work. We need to understand that problems doesn't mean to pull back. It means to submerge ourselves in God's will. The second thing I want to encourage everyone again to do is let's start to live our lives according to these great priorities. God has to be first in our lives. Let's put that first as we learn such a great love from the mothers around us that hey, if we put our love first in God, maybe one day too, I might have a mother's love. And again, happy Mother's Day. Thank you all very much. Thank you again for tuning on into our service. I really do hope that whether that's the contribution, communion, or the lesson helps you to grow in your faith. Yes, happy Mother's Day once again, and thank you for joining us. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and hopefully we'll be seeing you again in person soon. We send you our love. Have a great day. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach. Preach the word, you gotta preach, preach, preach the word, you gotta preach, preach, preach the word. Ah, you see, I was lost before I was found in my pride.